Father, may we do no damage, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, the answer to all human need. Allow me to begin this message today by saying two very important things about our Lord. I'm just going to pick out two today. There are multiple things that I could say, but just two. The first thing is this. There is no one, and I need you to hear me very well today. There is no one. Like Jesus. No one. No one. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to focus your attention on the two words, only begotten, only begotten, only begotten. Greek word is monogenes, monogenes, which literally means the only one of the family, only begotten, mono means only geno to form or to make or family. Jesus is the only one of the family. Only John uses monogenes to describe the relationship of Jesus to God the Father, presenting Christ as the unique begotten. Literally means unique. The only, unique is only, single, having no one like. When you speak of begotten, only begotten, it is there's no one else equal to. Only begotten, bless you mama, is unparalleled. Jesus is in a category all by himself. Amen. When you hear our Lord placed in categories, and I've heard it, and every time I hear it, I get a little hot under the collar. I get a little bothered. Jesus was a good man like Muhammad or like Buddha or like, no, 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 no. And all these new little religions that's coming out, these new, little new movements that the unlearned are falling for. Let me tell you something. There is nobody, no one like Jesus. There's no one like Jesus in Raleigh. There's no one like Jesus on the West Coast. There's no one like Jesus in America. There's no one like Jesus uh, in the Pan-American countries. There's no one like Jesus on this planet. There's no one like Jesus in this universe, this solar system, in the entire created world. There's no one like Jesus in heaven. There's no one like Jesus. I want to etch that in your mind. When God the Father gave us Jesus, he didn't give one of many. He had billions of and trillions of angels. Amen. He has seraphims and cherubims. There's 24 elders, four beasts. Yeah. And if he want more of anything else, he can create it. But there is only one Jesus, the Christ, 
son of the living God. You consider yourself privileged to know the only unique son of God. And you have a first name basis relationship with him. And he hears your prayer and answer your call. You better pray. Amen. Yeah, we yeah, we're gonna we're gonna celebrate Christmas time and celebrate him all year long because there's no one like him. Elijah Muhammad, please. Sanyon Moon. Daddy Grace, they're still waiting for him to rise from the dead. The Jehovah's Witness movement, they got the prediction of the Lord's coming wrong three times. I don't see how, I don't see how the religion even exists. Missed it big time. Now I hear about some of these other little rinky-dink things that's coming up that we're falling for, five percenters, woke, you name it, all this stuff. Let me tell you something. There is no one. Like Jesus. The second thing I want to say about Jesus, this unique one from the Father, is that he is the only bridge. He's the only stairway. He's the only mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 5 and 2 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. A mediator. A misos. The mediator is one who mediates between two parties. Dr. Yvonne Watford is here, uh, just a grand woman of God. She could tell you that when you go to court and there's mediation, mediation requires a mediator. Somebody's got to sit between two opposing parties and bring peace, uh, bring conciliation, uh, compromise, or satisfy the demands of both groups. A mediator. Jesus stood between the righteous demands of God the Father and our wicked sinful ways. And there was nothing that we could do in our fallen state to satisfy the just and righteous demands of the holy God who created everything. Jesus says, I'll step between wicked man and the righteous demands of God the Father, and I'll die for men. I'll pay the price for them. And every man who accepts me, from that point on, the Father will see them as having been covered in my blood. And so there will be peace between the father and that man because I am the mediator. And when the man falls short, I'm still the one who the Bible says he makes uh, intercession to God the father on our behalf. And I'm glad that he does. And he doesn't just make those intercessions when we pray and ask him to. Because a lot of times we don't know the shape we're in, but he knows. See, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, whom the Bible says he accuses us before God both day and night. He's always before the Father pointing out how we missed it, why we dropped the ball, how we fell short, what we did wrong. But Jesus is there to say, yes, but they're covered in my blood. Yes, but I paid the price for them. Yes, but they are mine. There's nobody. There's no one 
like Jesus. And he is our mediator. Why this? Because you know he's got to be awesome just by the attempts uh, that are in the world today to draw our attention away from him. It's interesting to me to watch the commercials as they bend over backwards. These marketers bend themselves in loops into pretzels to just whatever they have to do for the most part, many of them, to get around during this time of the year saying Christmas or Merry Christmas. Pam and I, while we were out of town, you know, we were somewhere and we saw happy holiday signs up. So I said to uh, a merchant, I said, tell me this. After I established and made friends, tell me this. How many gifts do you get during this holiday season? How many people come in and purchase Hanukkah gifts? She said, none. How many come in and purchase Kwanzaa gifts? None, that they, that they say. What about Christmas? All of them who say why they're buying, they say it's Christmas. So that's interesting because the only holiday, uh, the, the only observance that generates business for you this time of the year is Christmas. But your sign says, happy holidays. Well, we put up happy holidays because we don't want to offend anybody. I said, but what about those of us who are offended because we don't see Merry Christmas? See, does it not matter that we're offended? And when did the term Merry Christmas at Christmas time, become an offense. I, mean, I wouldn't be offended if someone said to me, Merry Christmas during the 4th of July. I, I would think they're a little mixed up. <laughs> uh, but to be offended, the word Christmas is the etymology of the word. It comes from Christ's. Mass, a mass, mass, a gathering, a gathering to recognize Christ. Christ's mass over years became Christmas. Amen. Then the devil got in and it became happy, happy holidays. Notice how we work hard, the devil works hard to redefine the meaning of Christmas. Christmas is about family. Christmas is about the season. It's about the holidays. It's about Santa. It's about Jesus. Now, you, you have to, when they say it's about Santa, there is some truth to that. But I, but I believe, if you'll let me preach, that based on what I know about him, If St. Nicholas met Santa Claus, St. Nicholas would probably punch him out. Based on what I know about St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas would be highly offended about how he has been used to replace and overshadow his Lord. For St. Nicholas uh, lived, he was born around A.D. 280 in a city, a port city in Asia Minor, Patera. When he was 10 years old, uh, a plague swept through Patera. And it killed many people. 
And among the people who died in the plague was his mom and dad. Thank God Nicholas had an uncle who was a priest. His uncle took him in. And Nicholas, as a young boy, having suffered the loss of both mom and dad, couldn't have happened today because he would have needed a psychiatrist. He'd been so bitter and asking the Lord, why me? Why you do me so wrong? And all that kind of stuff. Nicholas gave his heart to Jesus Christ as a young age, at a young age. By the time Nicholas was 19, Nicholas was a priest. By the time he was, a, uh, was 20, Nicholas had become a bishop. The bishop of Myra Lysa near Patera. Known for his compassion and great love for the poor, the disenfranchised, and the morally bankrupt. Nicholas was a saved, godly man. Can I preach? Interestingly enough, the good deeds of Nicholas that became the stuff of legend that have been uh, mythological, made myth of, and, and uh, things uh, that uh, have been secularized, his good deeds were done to prevent prostitution. Nicholas had a friend, a wealthy friend, who was a shipping merchant who fell on hard times. The shipping merchant had three daughters of marrying age. And during those years, when a young lady was presented to be married, her, her family had to also have a dowry for her. No dowry, no wedding. And so his shipping friend's three daughters, if they couldn't get married, they would be doomed to a life of loneliness and poverty. Somehow the word got to St. Nicholas that the oldest girl had decided to sell herself into prostitution so as to raise money for a dowry to help her sisters so that they would have a better life. Now, their dad was a man of great pride, and Nicholas knew that their dad would not accept a handout. So what Nicholas did was, on three consecutive nights, Nicholas placed a bag of gold. He was blessed where the family could easily find it. On the third night, he dropped the bag of gold down the chimney. One of the girls had washed her stockings and had the stockings hung by the chimney to dry out. The bag of gold fell in the stocking. For three nights he provided and provided diaries and kept the eldest daughter from going into prostitution. Are you with me? Nicholas loved the Lord. He was a defender of the faith. During that time, the doctrine of Christ was forming and there was a, um, a priest named Arias and Arias taught that Jesus Christ was more than human. He was more than man, but that he was not God, that he was not divine. So Constantine, the emperor, called a council, the council of bishops, to settle uh, this dilemma. And uh, Nicholas being a lover of Jesus as he was, Nicholas, while hearing uh, Arias 
call Jesus less than divine, Nicholas got mad. Nicholas punched Arias in the face and uh, he decked him and the man ran out of the council. That was the end of him. And uh, he cared for the Lord that much. Nicholas also loved children and started a ministry. He hired a baker and he hired a carpenter and he made toys for little poor kids and gave them to the children. It's believed on December the 6th, either in the year 342 or 352 AD, that Nicholas died. I think that he would be appalled since he hit Arias. I think he would be appalled at the whole Santa thing. I would be appalled. I would be angry if anybody in here tried to elevate me to the level of my Lord. I would be ready to fight if someone suggested that I am worthy of worship or attribute divine powers to me such as I know when you are sleeping and I know when you are awake. I know if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. That's divine power. Only the God of the Bible knows everything about us. So if St. Nicholas ever meets the mythological Santa Claus, all I can say to Santa is you better duck. <laughs> Back to my lesson. There are just so many things now that the devil is doing to draw us away from Christ. We live in a world of lies and we're all beginning to participate with lies. A man now can put on pumps and heals and call himself a woman and we go along with it. Two men can have a ceremony and uh, from the Supreme Court on down, they say that they are married, but no, they're not. The definition of marriage has not changed in the eyes of God. Amen. Marriage is a union between a man and a woman. The U.S. Supreme Court does not have the power to change what God has said. Amen. All of those judges are going to die like me because that's all they are. Are you threatening the judge? No, 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 no. I didn't say I'm going to kill him. I don't recommend that anyone else does. But without any assistance of ours, like me and like you, they're going to all die. Man cannot cross God. When President Obama said that same-sex marriage is the direction that this nation should go in, he stepped out of his lane because he's not God either. Man cannot cross God. We're living in a day now where we are being drawn away. Let me get back to the text. So you don't like me when I preach like this. But our text is the end of the first, well, it is the first conversation that our Lord had with a man who became a believer and a, and a disciple by the name of Nathaniel. Interestingly enough, for those who've been following the ministry, our text takes place after our Lord's temptations in the wilderness. After he defeats the devil. 
after the angels come and minister to him. Then he is recognized as the Lamb of God. Verse 29, who comes to take away the sins of the world. Then the next day, John calls, sees him coming and, and uh, says in verse 36 of chapter 1, St. John, Behold the Lamb of God. Now it's time for the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world to amass his team. Are you following? He begins to collect or call or gather the men who would be known as the 12 disciples, who would later on become the 12 apostles. Verse 43 picks it up and says, uh, on the following day, see, Jesus goes forth into Galilee. Now he's in Galilee. Are you with me? No longer in uh, Jerusalem. Not traveling with the devil anymore. <laughs> Goes to Galilee. Um, and findeth Philip. And said to Philip, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida. The city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, listen to this, we have found him of whom Moses in the law, Deuteronomy 18 and 18, let's look at it right quick. I'm going to preach in just a moment. Deuteronomy 18 and 18 says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak them all and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command them. They, this is among the prophets, prophecies that God would send forth a prophet like Moses. Verse 15 says, The Lord thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. This is Moses talking. And him shall ye hearken. So Moses had prophesied that a prophet was coming. Like himself. Now, I'm, 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 I want you to follow me. This kind of preaching is only for those who are interested in Bible study. For those who don't love the scriptures, this will put you to sleep. But I need to make this point. Because a blunder is made. And the blunder was so great that it made people misunderstand nothing. Philip made a blunder, but he meant well. All right. All right now. It's quiet in here. <laughs> Verse 45 says, And now Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law, I just read that to you, yes, and the prophets did right. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Nathaniel responds to Philip and said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Which was a perfectly legitimate question. It was a question that lets you know that Nathaniel 
was a man who knew the word of God. See, when you don't know the word, people can tell you the Bible says anything and you'll believe it. Well, you know, the Bible says if you make one step, he'll make two. Amen, brothers. Hallelujah. It's not in the Bible. You know, the Bible said God help those that help themselves. That's not in the Bible. It's amazing the number of things that people say is in the Bible that we'll go, uh huh, amen to, because we don't read the Bible. But when you read the Bible, when you know the word, then your, your antennas go up. You, you're alerted when you hear something that is contrary to what's actually in the Bible. But most Christians don't know the Bible. Many of us, we read everything but the Bible. Get up in the morning and give God a devotional scripture. And that's, that's my devotion for the day. One verse, Jesus wept. Now what you gonna get out of that to keep you through, through the day? Every man ought to be an avid student of the word of God. Every woman ought to be a student of the word of God. You should take pride in Bible study. You should take pride. This crowd right here should look like this on Thursday nights when we study the Bible. Some of you, you are saved and love the Lord and have never been to church on Thursday night. Never been to Bible study. In conversations with you, many of you have never heard you quote a scripture. Many of us can never make arguments by saying the Bible says. Our arguments are a barbershop. They start with this, quote, honey child if it was me. End of quote. That is meaningless. You're not the source of overarching truth. And I'm not either. But the Bible is. You need to know the Bible. How well do you know the God of the Bible? The answer is how well you know the Bible. If you have very little knowledge of the Bible, you have very little knowledge of the God of the Bible. I've been knowing the man a long time. That's part of the problem. <laughs> you need to get to know the Lord. Let me get back to this. Are you following me? Uh, Philip, in his exuberance, in his excitement, makes a blunder that Nathaniel being a wordy person, one who knew the scriptures automatically caught. Because Nathaniel knew something. Nathaniel knew that there were and there are no scriptures. There's no prophecies written anywhere that said that the Messiah would come from Nazareth. The prophecy, Micah 2 and 2 says, but thou Bethlehem, you frotha, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose going forth have been from of old and from everlasting. The prophecy was that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Now we all know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. I mean, you know that from the Christmas story. <laughs> Angels watching over their flocks by night, you know. All right, Bethlehem. Yes, sir. But to Philip's credit, they had just met Jesus. They hadn't talked long enough to get acquainted and to know 
where he was born. But what they knew about him was enough to cause them to believe him. But Nathaniel, being as wordy as he was, it clicked in him. Wait a minute. A Messiah from Nazareth? And of all places, Nazareth. Nazareth, a little town with no more than 2,000 people. A nothing town. Nazareth, a town that was a rival village of uh, Nathaniel's hometown, about 10 miles probably north of Bethsaida. That was uh, Nazareth, you see. And uh, Nazareth did not have a good reputation. Nazareth was a city that was wicked. And it had a terrible reputation. So Philip calls him Jesus of Nazareth. So Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip, not knowing how to address Nathaniel's objections, Philip simply says, come and see. See, 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 I, I look, I know you have objections, but I, I, I've seen enough, Philip says, to be convinced. Uh, uh, Peter is convinced. Andrew is convinced. You come and see. Thank God that Andrew, that, that Nathaniel went. So that goes to show uh, that there's power in excitement. That power and joy. I want a lot of souls to Christ when I first got saved. I, I, during that time, I didn't know three scriptures. Couldn't find the 23rd Psalm. The pastor said, turn to the book of Matthew. I was way over there in Daniel. But my joy. See, I didn't know the Bible at the time, but I knew that uh, somebody had touched me. And, and, and I knew that, that a change had taken place on the inside. Good God Almighty. Yeah, I knew that. And, and the folk I was talking to, they could see the change. Nathaniel knew that Philip uh, didn't quite know everything that he was talking about. But he knew this. Philip and the boys, they met somebody. They're saying that he's from Nazareth. Let me go and check this out. So don't look down on Nathaniel for having a perfectly legitimate objection. Admire him that he went on to check it out anyhow. Can I get a witness? And uh, Nathaniel goes, verse 47, it says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, ah. See, now notice this. Uh, as Nathanael approached, Jesus didn't wait for Nathanael to say anything. Jesus made the first move. We'll find out that this might have been his third move a fourth move that he, he had made. Are you following me? So now, Jesus sees Nathaniel coming and he says to him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no God. Now, this is amazing because you got to keep in mind that Jesus and Nathaniel had never previously met. Jesus communicates with him to show that, first of all, something special came out of Nazareth. Because whoever this is that came out of Nazareth, he knows, first of all, he knows your name. And he knows your character. And he knows your race. 
Jesus says to him, without having met him, you are Israelite indeed. Woo! You are a true Jew. You are, praise the Lord, a real Israelite. You're just like me. We're both Israelites. And not only are you a true Israelite, but you are a man in whom there is no guile. What a compliment. Oh God, I wonder would Jesus said that, say this about any of us. Guile is deceit. Guile is trickery. Guile is treachery. Guile is underhandedness. Preach, wouldn't it? It's getting better. Jesus said to Nathaniel, you are a man that has no God in him. Now, pray with me. This is a reference. You're going to see it in a minute. That not only was Jesus talking about Nathaniel's character, but Jesus will let Nathaniel know something else that spoke to Jesus' supernatural power. See, I'm going to show you in the scripture that before Philip told Nathaniel about Jesus, Nathaniel had been studying the scriptures about a man who got a revelation from God, but that man was filled with God. And he got a revelation. Praise the Lord. Some of them are freezing in here. They got to cope. Help, help the saints. Amen. And, uh, and so Jesus says to Nathaniel, you have better character than the man that you've been reading about. For you have no God in you. So what it was literally saying to him was, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no God. But listen, in whom there is no Jacob. Because Nathaniel had been reading about a man who was full of God. A trickster if, he, if there's ever been one. And he had to leave his father's house because he lied to his daddy and swindled his brother out of his birthright. And he was on the run. But while on the run, he stopped in a certain place. And where he stopped, God met him. Are you following me? Uh, Genesis 28 and 10 says, and Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went toward Haran, a 500 mile journey. And he lighted upon a certain place. Mm-hmm and tarried there all night. This was the first day of the journey because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows, took some stones and built them up for a pillow to lay his head and lay down in that place. This is Jacob a man full of God before the Lord could deliver him, before he got right with God. This is who Nathaniel, as you will see in just a moment, was reading about. For when Jesus said this to Nathaniel and said to him, back to our text, 
you are a man with no guile. Nathaniel says to Jesus uh, in verse uh, 48, Nathaniel said unto him, whence knowest thou me? He says, how do you know me? How do you know what kind of man I am? How do you know that I'm a man uh, with no guile? How, how do you know, praise the Lord, what I've been reading? See, Jesus is flexing his muscles. Uh-huh. And uh, then Jesus really took it home with him. The Lord says, before Philip called you, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now it's sad that preachers used to say Nathaniel was lazy. He was sleeping under the fig tree. Uh, when thou wast under the fig tree is not a reference to laziness. When thou was under the fig tree is an idiomatic Jewish Hebrew statement which references you were under the fig trees. The fig trees in the Bible days were, they cast a lot of shade from the hot sun. And it was, it was customary for teachers and for men to get under the fig tree in its shade and study the word, pray, and meditate. So Jesus says, before Philip found you, to tell you about me, I saw you under the fig tree studying about Jacob. Supernatural power. I, I'm, I'm preaching. Uh, uh, there's nobody like Jesus. He, he, praise Lord. He, he, he is the answer to all human need. And then, and then he says something, Deacon Miller. You, you'll appreciate this. He said, "I saw thee." Do you see that? That's a direct reference. That's a direct reference. A direct reference. And Nathaniel understood it to Psalms, oh my Lord, where God says in the Psalms, uh, uh, I know your down sittings. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I know uh, your upright. Psalm 39. Let me show you something about God. I'm going to preach uh, after a while. Psalm 39 and 1 said, Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and know me, for thou knowest my down sittings, my and mine uprisings. Uh huh. Thou understandest my thoughts from where you are. <laughs> thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. When Jesus said to Nathaniel, I saw you before Philip even told you about me. God Almighty, that tells you something about Jesus. Jesus was telling him, not only do I know your character, but I know where you were, and I know what you were reading. Good God Almighty. And when Nathaniel heard this, see, being a man who knew the word, see, that, that was convincing on that level for him. When he heard that, Nathaniel changed altogether. And Nathaniel answered and said unto him, first thing Nathaniel called him was, Nathaniel humbled himself and called Jesus rabbi. Nathaniel went from being a little, uh, not belligerent, but he had objections to saying to Jesus, you're my teacher. Teacher, rabbi. And then secondly, he said something that uh, let me know that he really, praise the Lord, saw who Jesus was, he said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. God Almighty, Psalms 2 and 7 says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And Nathaniel called Jesus the Son of God. And then he said, thou art the King of Israel phrase king of Israel literally means you are the coming Messiah. Bible said in Zephaniah 3.15 the Lord hath taken away thy judgments. 
he hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt see evil no more. So Nathaniel now recognizes Jesus as being the Messiah. A man in whom there was no guy still needed to be saved. Jesus don't just save drunks. Jesus doesn't simply save uh, uh, drug addicts. He doesn't only save those who are down and out. Jesus saved those who are up and in. You intellectual types, you with money, you with power and prestige, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs to be saved. Doesn't matter how, how well off you feel you are. Doesn't matter how educated you may think you are. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You need Jesus. You need to be saved. You can win the Heisman. You can win the Super Bowl. You can win the NBA Finals. You can uh, sell a billion records. But let me tell you something. The songwriter is still right. You can build a, a skyscraper grand and tall. But let me tell you something. You can conquer all the failures of your past. But only what you do for Christ will last everybody needs Jesus Nathaniel broke and got saved and, and, and what I love about Jesus is Jesus marveled at how little it took to bring him around so Jesus looks at Nathaniel and says to him because I said to thee I saw thee under the fig tree believest thou that I could tell you that I saw you before Philip found you. That was all that it took. And that's not a letdown. I'm glad that I didn't have to hear the gospel 10,000 times before I got saved. I'm glad that I didn't have to wait 50 years, praise the Lord, and then get saved. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. For those of you who, who had to, it took, it took all kinds of things for you to finally come around, that's your testimony. And I'm proud of yours, but I'm proud of mine. I'm proud that at 16, when I heard the word of God, praise the Lord, that that, 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 that was enough for me. I, I got saved and the Lord saved me. I'm glad that he did. It didn't take much to get uh, Nathaniel to come around. And I'll tell you something else. It didn't take much either, praise the Lord, to get men uh, like Philip. Jesus said to Philip, he said to Matthew, he said, follow me. <laughs> now with Peter and Andrew, he had to talk to them a little bit. Got to talk to y'all about a little fishing. I got to get on your level. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so now he, he's winning Nathaniel here and he tells Nathaniel, listen, if you think that this is something... Other words, he says, hold on to your seat. Upper room, if you think 2017 was something, let 2018 come in. God has greater things. God has greater things. Oh, uh, hallelujah. The, the battles will be greater, but the victory will also. Yes, sir, the devil will be the devil, but the Lord will still be God. And let me tell you something. The devil is defeated. God is exalted. And Jesus is Lord. Somebody shout something in here today. Hey, 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 hey. And uh, he said to him, because I saw you under the fig tree, uh -huh. you believe? Uh, he says, uh, thou shalt see greater things than this. Now, why the emphasis on seeing? Why all this seeing stuff? You know why? I just told you. Because he had just finished reading about uh, Jacob. Jacob while on the run. In Genesis chapter 28, he stops. Yeah. Hallelujah. He sets up pillows, running from his daddy, running from his brother, sets up pillows, and in verse 12, he dreamed a dream. And I said, behold, a ladder set up on the earth. Most manuscript says a stairway. 
<laughs> Stairway to heaven. Don't you want to go? And uh, that was a stairway set up. God Almighty. And uh, it says, it's set up on the earth and, uh, and the top of it reached to heaven. See that in your mind's eye. Ladder, a stairway from earth to heaven. And uh, behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Mm, this man who was full of guile saw a vision. He saw a stairway to heaven. And he saw the angels going up the stairway to heaven and then coming back down the stairway. Oh Lord, what is this symbolic of? Uh -huh, the angels, when they had their inquiries, when they had questions, I'm preaching about Jesus being the answer to all human need. When the angels didn't understand, the angels would take their questions and their inquiries and go upstairs to heaven and talk to God the Father. And when they would get the answers, they would bring those answers back down. Some of the answers were to inquiries that the angels had on their own. And some of the answers, the angels' inquiries was the prayers of the people of God. And they would take those prayers up to heaven and give them to God. And God would give the angel, good God Almighty, the answer. And they would bring it back down to the earth. And uh, when Jacob saw this, the Bible tells me that after he saw them ascending and descending, the text tells me that Jacob woke up. Are you with me? And uh, play, praise the Lord. It says in verse 16, And Jacob awakened out of his sleep. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful uh, is this place. Dreadful here being wonderful. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob arose early in the morning and took the, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar. He made a monument out of the stone and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place, the place of answers. He called it Bethel. Uh, hallelujah. Now the word Bethel means house of God. Are you following me? So he said, in this place, I got a revelation from God. In this place, I got my answers from the Lord. Somebody go help me preach. Jacob said, in this place, the Lord gave me a vision. And the Lord worked on me in this place. In this place called Bethel. But I had Jesus when he spoke to Nathaniel he said hereafter you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending but notice uh, in Bethel they ascended and descended on Bethel Jesus said they are going to ascend and descend on me for I am the new Bethel. I am the place of answers. I am the answer to all human need. Everything you need from heaven, you can get it from me. This is why the devil is doing everything he can to take your mind away from Jesus because the devil knows that Jesus is all we need. The devil knows that Jesus can heal you your body, fix your mind, fix your family, 
the devil knows that the black community the white community the Asian community the Muslim community the atheist community hallelujah the Wiccans and all the rest he knows that Jesus is all they need for in all of those other religions there are no answers but in Jesus we find every answer good God almighty how many have have discovered that all you need you find in Jesus that joy he supplies he gives us strength when we're weak he lifts us up when we're sinking low if you have questions he'll answer your questions don't look any further don't run from Jesus don't run from the altar but instead run in his direction grab hold to the Bible call on him in prayer for he is he's the answer he is he's the point he is he's the only move of God in this world I want you right now to lift your hands and praise him because he is he's the answer ready to close but I challenge you to shake somebody's hand and say Jesus is all I need he's all he's all I need yeah yeah joy in the morning good God almighty peace at night picks me up gives me power when I'm weak, he makes me strong. He's a healer. He's a way maker. Yes, he is. He's my savior. He's my joy supplier. He's the answer to every question. Yeah. Yes. Somebody praise him if you believe it. I wish I had somebody to help me say, he's all, all I need, yes he is. Hey, hey Lord, oh, tell somebody, don't look any further, don't leave the Lord, doesn't matter how hard the road may get, doesn't matter how heavy the Lord may be the Lord is he's all you need to win that battle to get over and to get by and I don't know about you but I'm going to serve him till the day I die good God almighty he's a mighty fine leader he's a mighty fine keeper the oh Lord he's a friend when you're friendly he'll be there in the time of a storm oh oh lord i love the lord he heard my cry pitied my every groan somebody lift your hands and praise the lord and say as long as i live as long as i live and trouble rise i'll hear to his throne
his throne. I wonder if anybody here today who have a few things up before the Lord. If you're here, you ought to haze. Son to his throne. Ooh, Lord. Somebody ought to run down the aisle and say, Lord, I need your help. Oh, Lord, I need your deliverance. is strong hey. yeah 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 he's the answer he's the answer for that fear in your life he's the answer to that cancer you're dealing with he's the answer to that broken marriage he's the answer to that troubled mind he the answer for that wayward child. He's the answer if you're struggling with perversion. He's the answer waiting on a job. He's the answer whatever the problem. Whatever. Ah, whatever. Look at somebody and say, whatever it is. You don't have any attitude in that. You got to get a little faith in and say, whatever it is, the Lord is. He's the answer. I've learned Missionary Wilborn, I learned to haste, hasten to run to his throne. Yeah. 